Hey, this is Andy Hill from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast. And when I'm not singing Disney karaoke songs with my kids at home, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. <laughs> I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and happy International Afternoon Tea Day. If you're listening with your tea, that's jolly good. Otherwise, you're in America. Either way, on today's show, we're talking about planning for that catastrophic illness. What's changed in the world of long-term care? Help us welcome from Nationwide Insurance, Sean Britt. Plus, in our headline segment, those three-day money transfers, are they finally going away? Maybe we'll explain. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener and leave time for my incredible trivia. And now, two guys who are podcasting and they can't get up. Joe and O J J J J G. Starts to feel like that after a while, doesn't it? Like we sit down and wash, rinse, repeat. And an hour wash, later, rinse, repeat. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to Monday back here in the basement. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And that voice you hear, silk on the microphone. It's my good friend, the Just other guy. pure, pure butter. I'm okay. sure it makes everyone uh, giggle as they're either driving down the road or walking the dog. Like, I can't wait to hear OG. It's going to be fantastic. It goes around. OG has quite a vocabulary by the way it's so big that sometimes we have to bleep it out (laughs) (laughs) and by the way you know where og got that vocabulary big thanks to grammarly for supporting stacky benjamins grammarly is a communication tool that helps tools like og improve their writing to be mistake free clear and effective yeah i just rolled that one right out there start writing confidently by heading to Grammarly.com forward slash SB to get 20% off a Grammarly premium account today. I love my Grammarly premium account. It always tells me I know all the words and I use most of them incorrectly. The, <laughs> also, it's big thanks to Acre Trader investing in farmland. So boring in a good way. Thanks to Acre Trader for supporting SB. For more information on how to become a farmland investor, through Acre Trader, head to acretrader.com forward slash SB. More on them later. But right now, we got Sean Britt coming down to the basement. This is a big issue, OG. You know, it, it's got to be the way it used to be when I was an advisor, man. You start talking about what happens if you have a catastrophic illness and your client looks back at you and goes, let's not talk about that. I'm super healthy. I really would prefer we don't talk about that. But if we got to talk about it, having somebody who's entertaining a Sean Britt to talk to about it makes it way better. But first, we've got some big headlines this week, some new stuff, a little new fintech, maybe some new stuff from the Fed. Mm, let's see what's going on. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. You see this headline? The Fed is creating a payment system to speed up money transfers. <laughs> I did not see this. They bought Zell. <laughs> well, I think they're getting rid of that whole three-day ACH thing. Maybe that's what the, the deal is. Well, I've railed against this before. The fact that you can deposit a check from another account that you own. It comes out of your bank account that night. And then you go to the other bank and you go, see, look, it's already out. I got it. It's, can I use this money? They're like, no, it's going to take three days. <laughs> like, it doesn't take three days. It is already out of the other account. I just went to pay a credit card on a credit union credit card that we've had for 300 years. The only reason we have it is because it's the oldest line of credit we have. So we got the letter that says, you've got to use this or we're going to close it. So we used it. Bought a pack of gum, right? Guess who didn't make the payment? <laughs> this guy. Because I never use it, so I didn't even think about it. <laughs> Anyways, so you get the letter. Hey, uh, your $6 gas station thing, we charged you $10 in late fees. I'm like, cool, I'll just go online and pay it, whatever. Stupid tax, right? 
So I go online and pay. They're like, yeah, you can't pay with that bank account. You have to transfer money to, you know, you have to link your bank account. Oh. Like, Great, link my bank account. Yep. Like it's going to take five business days. I'm like, uh, okay. So I called the credit union and said, hey, listen, I want to pay this, but you guys refuse to take my money. They waived the $10 late fee, which is great. Wait my five days, go online to pay it. New transfers from bank accounts take five business days to process. <laughs> I'm like, it's, it's $10. <laughs> this piece is written by Lolita Clozel at the journal. The Federal Reserve plans to develop a faster payment system for banks to exchange money, providing a public option to another real-time network built by big banks. The new system would allow bill payments, paychecks, and other common consumer business transfers to be available instantly and round the clock, a change from the government's current system that's closed on weekends and can at any time take days to settle a transaction. The Fed said it anticipates the new service will be available in 2023 or 2024. <laughs> working really hard. We're working out too fast. We're fast-tracking this. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they are. <laughs> It'll support payments of up to $25,000. Everyone deserves the same ability to make and receive payments immediately and securely, and every bank deserves the same opportunity to offer that service to its community. Fed Governor Lael Brainerd said in a speech at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City on Monday, Fed voted 4-1 to one to build the new network. Vice Chairman for Supervision Randall Quarles dissented. I do not see a strong justification for the Federal Reserve to move into this area and crowd out innovation when viable private sector alternatives are available, he said. Big banks have waged a lobbying effort to stop the Fed from developing the new system. The banks, including Citigroup, yeah, JP, uh, JP Morgan Chase and U.S. Bancorp have invested a total of about a billion dollars in their own instant payment system. So you wonder if they already have it, why aren't we using it? Well, there's a reason. Launched in 2017, it's operated by the Clearinghouse Payments Company. They argued a competing Fed system would delay the spread of faster payments with some smaller banks likely to wait until the central bank launches its system. The Fed's decision was supported by smaller banks, big technology companies, and some lawmakers. Those largest banks are competitors. That gives our members a choice, independent community bankers of America. Basically, what happened here is you go down the article, these guys developed a payment system. And said, yes, yeah, small banks, you can't use it that quickly. <laughs> They're dragging their feet on letting competitive banks use it. Hmm. Who knew? Stifling out innovation then, I guess, huh? Just like they said. <laughs> More like stifling competition. What's funny is I don't necessarily think we always need the government to step in to uh, create more competition. However, I do think you look at the role that fintech's playing on the other end, you know, it, it was coming from other sides anyway. You talked about Zelle, you know, PayPal in some instances now making money instantly available. You've got yeah. these other competing payment systems already coming. And I think that was going to be the driver. I think this idea, by the way, of 2023 or 2024, public's not going to stand for it for that long. We're already pretty sick of it to the point that, you know, Venmo is huge. Yeah. Our babysitters take Venmo now. I remember... We were coming home from date night one night and my wife said, we, Hey, we got to stop at the bank, get some cash. I said, can you just text her and see if they take Venmo? And they'd rather have that. There's Apple pay, all these different payment things. I, I picked up a book for my brother, texted him, told him he owed me 15 bucks. And eight seconds later, I got $15 on my Apple pay thing. I can, whatever you can use Apple pay for, but it's there. I could use it if I could ever find what to use it on. Was that steak brother? Yeah. Did you charge him like 27% interest? He's making installment payments on his $115 stake. <laughs> in our, in our, you'll have those payments paid off by 2027. I am charging him 29% interest, so it's working out okay for me. <laughs> Plus a $100 late fee. That's yeah. right. A second headline comes to us from CNBC. Uh, Snoop Dogg back firm Klarna becomes Snoop Europe's biggest Dogg. fintech startup. It's already at $5.5 billion, the valuation. You see this? Pocket change to a guy like you. Swedish online payment firm Klarna announced Tuesday it's reached a $5.5 billion valuation following a $460 million funding round, making it Europe's largest private fintech company. Listen to what these guys do, OG. Do you know what Klarna does? No idea. Stockholm-based startup provides a buy now, pay later service for shoppers. Basically, the way that it works is that you can buy stuff now, get a 0% loan, 
But if you miss the payment on that loan, they sock it to you. Okay. So kind of like buying furniture? You used a phrase earlier, stupid tax. I coined that, by the way. That was trademarked. It's, it's all you. No TM. one has ever used that before. Never. I think this idea of retail therapy that you can't afford, so you sign up for Klarna and you're able to magically buy this stuff you can't afford. I think this is horrible. Yeah, there's a company, I can't remember the name of their ad, it's, it'll come to me, but the thing that's funny about it is you can buy TVs and you know refrigerators and all that sort of stuff because tagline is, you deserve it. You yeah. deserve it, Joe. Yeah. Hey, you don't have the money for it, but you deserve it. You, you go down you this article, listen to what it says. It says, the uniqueness of Klarna's consumer offering, this is a company press release, providing a healthier, simpler, and smarter alternative to credit cards with the addition of multiple services to smoothen the shopping experience online and out, offline is clearly resonating with the U.S. consumer. The fact that it's clearly resonating doesn't make it phenomenal. And yes, it is better than a credit card where you're going to have interest nearly immediately. And people go, oh, I just make a payment every month and pay 20% to Citigroup and I'm fine. Okay. If you make your payments on time with Klarna, you don't have to. Is it healthier? Maybe if you make the payments. But if I can't afford it, if I can't afford it, why am I buying it? Because you deserve it, Joe. I think that because I can't have a Super Bowl party without the biggest TV in the neighborhood. You ever notice though some of these things that you feel like you really want, and if you just wait two days, you wait a couple days. Like that's how I know if I really want the latest board game or not. I put it on my list. I'm like man, I oh that looks great. I'm going to order it mm-hmm. right now. I'm like you know what? I'm going to wait 48 hours. Nine times out of ten, two days later, I go. Yeah, yeah, I don't need that. You and I are so different. <laughs> Two days later, you still want it? I'm having a real tough time right now with something that I'm working on, thinking about acquiring. And I push it back to my wife and I say, you know, hey, is this a really stupid idea? And, you know, it could work out fine and that sort of thing. It could be a pain in the butt, but I think it's okay. And, and she's like, listen, you've already made your mind up. <laughs> You're just, you're just trying to make it work. Well, no, but that's, but, but that's the thing. If it's something that's really important to you and you're going on for two, three weeks, I think then it is just a matter of making it work. I had the same thing back in, back in the early days of satellite radio. I remember walking into Best Buy and for the first time I see, instead of the crappy four or five stations that are local, I can listen to all this different stuff. And you've known me for a long time. I love great radio. I know, you know, I'm a podcast addict, audio books, uh, Sirius. I listen to all of them and I listen to a ton of different stations on Sirius. But man, I remember, dude, it took me like four or five months. I'm like, pay for radio? Yeah, I don't think so. And at that time, this was (laughs) this was before all the free radio promos. This is when X7 Sirius were separate companies. And so you had to you know, I think like 100 or 120 bucks. Which which, which side you were on. Yeah. Yeah. And that was excruciating because one had the NFL and the other one had baseball. And I love both of those. So, man, I took forever. (laughs) Pay for radio. That's a funny way to put that. Yeah. (laughs) But it was justified, you know, it was trying to find a way to justify it. And finally, I ended up buying it. Never regretted it. Obviously, never looked back. I, I feel like for me now, uh, of course, for a lot of people, satellite radio, just something they've added to the mix of their subscriptions every month. Which can get slippery, too, right? You start adding all those $9 oh, subscriptions sure. in there and if, you go, holy crap, I, I'm spending 200 bucks a month. Satellite radio is horrible, I think, if you don't, you know, if you barely... Listen to your listen to your radio. I thought about getting rid of it. In fact, I did get rid of it in one of our vehicles. It's only in you one. Showed them. It's only it's only in, in in one car. The other thing about satellite radio that's a trick now because they always have these deep discounts. Let it expire. Within a month, they will send you the world's greatest offer. Uh, within a month, they will mm-hmm. call you and call you and call you to get you back. Wait about a month if you can hold on, and I do it every time. And I get it back and it's, it's a radio I love at a much cheaper price than advertised. But I think this idea though of waiting and deliberating is an important one. Retail therapy. 
Well, there's a lot of good reasons to do that anyway. If you, it's called the shopping cart trick. If you put the put your thing in the shopping cart, you know, so you're going to buy something at, it doesn't work on Amazon, but let's say you're going to buy a sweater at J. Crew for $300 or something, put it in the shopping cart, create an account, and then close the browser. You know, within a day or two, like you said, with Sirius, same thing happens. You get an email that says, hey, uh, we're running a special 25% off everything in your shopping cart or some kind of discount because they've got you right on the fence. So I think just waiting anyway will save you money. Plus, you compound that with the times that you say, yeah, and second thought, you know, I don't need a neon green sweater. It's funny how often that works. And by the way, that's also the magic for Amazon of their one-click ordering. <sighs> I by, didn't see that, but you're right. By the time you regret it, you already own it. Right. Like it's, it is horrible. That one click, one click system is, is horrible. I think that's probably lesson number one is use at least the two day rule. Lesson number two, I don't think you got to wait three years for the fed to create their online payment system. Use cash. It's immediate. <laughs> Find a different way. Sean Britt upstairs talking to mom. This this woman is such an expert in the area of long-term care and really makes it easy to talk about. I've been looking for this person forever because it's a topic that's so difficult, as you know, OG, to bring to the table. She's been engaged in the life insurance and long-term care industry for about 25 years. She's been with Nationwide since 2000. She has been a major influence in the development of uh, all of that company's long-term care solutions. We're not going to talk much about Nationwide today. We're going to talk about the bigger issues that you see from the insurer side. We often hear from the non-insurer's side, but what's innovative? What's changing? As prices go through the roof on long-term care, number one, why the hell are they going through the roof? Number two is what can we do about it to kind of mitigate those costs? And um, number three, really, what's the problem altogether? Sean's a frequently published author of white papers on long-term care. She also has been interviewed in all kinds of trade publications and national media, including CLTC TM Quarterly Digest. That's a fun publication. You, you want to sit and giggle? A bunch of long-term care nerds hanging out, industry insiders chatting. If you want to get to sleep, I bet that's a great publication. But seriously, the National Underwriter, Financial Advisor, uh, The Wall Street Journal, CBS Money Watch, Market Watch Radio, Life Health Pro. She's been all over the place. But most importantly, guess who we got coming down to the basement right now? Sean Britt. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, Sean Britt. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Joe? Well, I'm good. And it's so frustrating, this issue, talking about long-term care. It's great that I finally met another long-term care nerd like myself. Well, I'm glad that there is another nerd <laughs> <laughs> like yourself to it's talk to. The two of us. Yes. Right. Uh, when did you first get worried about this issue of long-term care? Oh, years. I mean, way ahead of, of time. I mean, before the industry got aware of it, I was the youngest grandchild of a very large family. So I was seeing at a very young age, my cousins were old enough to be my parents. So you, my aunts and uncles could, in theory, have been even grandparents. So I'm watching all of them age at a very young age and saw what was going on with families having to take care of each other. Also seeing the trends in America changing where, for instance, my aunt, she had four children and they all lived within a mile of her house. Yeah. So they were all, all, always able to check in on her. And until she hit 97, she stayed in her house. Because of that, it was only when she actually needed medical attention that she, she went to assisted living when she needed more than the children could actually take care of. But other people in my family start, they were transferred. You know, America became transient. And that changed the whole outlook of long-term care because it's no longer parents moving in with children. It's, it's a different world now. I'm thinking about my kids. My daughter's in Kansas City. My son's in Seattle. Yeah, they're not going to take care of you. Yeah, Forget no. about it. <laughs> but, but, but you, and you know, it's funny because I'm right there with you. I'm looking at my parents with their parents. 
but me with my parents, people are also working longer, which makes it difficult for kids to take care of parents anyway that way as well. Right. What's really sad is that 75% of caregivers are still women, but they're working now. Yeah. So imagine the stress that they have having to work all day and then go take care of their mother or mother-in-law, or it might be the father and father-in-law, or both. Generally, it ends up being grandma, because we women end up surviving you men, Yeah. for the most part. You don't have to rub it in, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what ends up happening is she is overstressed and it, it affects her children's lives, her marriage. It affects everything. It may even affect her job in that she has to pass up a promotion she worked years for or take a reduction in pay because she has to cut back her hours. So it has a big financial impact to families. And it doesn't mean that families can't help take care of each other. But there are ways to do it in which a family member could maybe be financially compensated, which takes the financial stress mm -hmm. off. And financial stress bleeds into other stress. If you can take that one stress off, you've eliminated some of the other stresses automatically. Well, it's like anything. I mean, the number one thing couples fight about is money, right? Exactly. So you take off that stress and we can now fight about other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, right. like every other American <laughs> family. And I want to get into strategies about how we would take care of a long-term care stay. But mm -hmm. there's this issue that we're talking about I think is really important. When I was a financial planner, there was this group of people, I'm sure you still see this group of people today being in the industry, where they go, oh, my family will take care of me or people around me will take care of me. It isn't really about you as much as, I mean, I've, I've seen studies and I'm sure you've seen these too, where caretakers pass away from the stress before the person who's being taken care of. Caretakers age unbelievably during yes. that time. Like it's not about you as much as it's about everybody else in your family. That's true. In fact, there are studies showing that 40% of people taking care of an Alzheimer's patient, we're talking seniors taking care of seniors. So yeah. the wife taking care of the Alzheimer's husband, 40% of them will predecease. 40%. That's a huge number. Think about the family reunion you went to. Where, you know, your aunt was always this beautiful woman who looked 10 years younger her whole life, and all of a sudden she looks horrible. And you go home and you're saying, what happened to Aunt Marge? Yeah. And then you realize Uncle Joe's been dealing with dementia. That's what happened to Aunt Marge. And all of a sudden her, her 10 years of having on age is gone. And in fact, she looks 10 years older than she is. Let's talk about how big this problem is, because some people don't realize what an issue long-term care really is. What are the probabilities that something might happen to me or to you? Well, I don't really like talking about risk. I can tell you what it is. There's a 70% chance that you'll need long-term care, but the truth is... And that just includes, is, by the way, that's not in a facility. That's just at some point... At some point you in your life. taken care of by somebody. Some way, somehow. Yeah. 70% chance. Those are government statistics. The problem is, is that nobody really wants to accept they're going to be in the 70%. They will cling, especially that healthy male will say, I plan to be in the 30% as if they can control it. If you were to tell someone there was a 95% chance that they would need long-term care, <laughs> that healthy male is going to say, I'm planning to be in that 5%. I'm a very safe skier. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about the probability really isn't the question. The question is, what are the consequences of not having a plan? Yeah. I mean, no plan is a plan. It's a really bad plan, but it's even still a plan. What we want to have is a good plan. We want to have instructions laid out for the children. We want to have funding to take care of our instructions. The more plans you have in place, and if you have funding ready to go, the more choices and flexibility you have when such a time comes. I used to explain this issue to people that you had three choices. You could either delegate all of the risk to an insurance company. Mm -hmm. That may be incredibly expensive. And we can talk about how costs have changed over the years. The second thing you can do is uh, take that risk yourself. A lot of people call that self-insure. Or you can do a combination of the, of the two. Do you look at it in those terms? Yeah, except I disagree with one thing, your term using self-insure. Oh. There is no such thing as self-insuring. One has to realize when you insure, you're immediately leveraging your dollars. So the soon as you start paying premium, you have a promise from the insurance company that they'll pay you a certain amount. That's immediate leverage. You can't do that with your own money. It's dollar for dollar. It's dollar for dollar. Yeah. Exactly. So you can self-fund, 
But that requires a certain amount of time and a certain rate of return and hoping you're right. So I call self-funding unsuring because you're unsure of the time you're going to have to do it and you're unsure of the return you're going to get on the funds that you're saving. So will you get there in time? You will never know that until unless, the time comes. Yeah, I mean, unless you have that equal amount of money set aside now mm-hmm. and you can make sure that money's never used for anything else. It's like in a glad bag that you set aside only for that, but Correct. you really have to have it ahead of time is what you're saying. Ahead, right. Yeah. You have to, and how many people have that ahead of time? Yeah. So that's where insuring or combination of self-funding and insuring becomes a more practical solution for most people to have the funding that allows them the choice and flexibility and the type of care they want. We'll talk about insurance in a second, but let's talk about long-term care stays, long-term care help. Mm-hmm. What type of money, Sean, are we talking about? Because a lot of people don't even know what this stuff costs. Well, first of all, I like to point out the fact, if you know, if you knew, if you actually were told, you will need long-term care, but you will only need it for three months, would a person likely buy insurance? No. What if it were six months? Maybe, but probably not. Probably not. So you're probably thinking, we'd have to get to at least a year before we'd even think about insurance. Yeah. Well, the fact is that if you make it a year, your average claim will then be four years. If you make it a year, on average, your claim will be four years. That's what we're insuring for. We're insuring for the long term, not the short term. We don't worry about short-term, long-term care. We worry about long-term, long-term care. (laughs) Exactly. That's why it's called long-term care. Right. I think that's the first thing for people to realize. You want to make sure that if if your care situation turns into a long-term care event. Yeah, that horror story. That you have that leveraged money ready to go whenever that event happens. Got it. If it happens. How much cash per year does the average person go through? Or is that different community to community? It's going to vary. On average, a home health care aid will cost 45000 a year, depending on how you know where you are in the country and how many hours a day that you need care. Assisted living will run anywhere, again, depending where you're staying, forty to 70000 a year. And then nursing home care is up at around 100000 a year. Now, most people won't go to a nursing home. That's people's biggest fear. But if they do, they're looking in today's dollars, 100000 a year. What? That all seems backwards to me. I mean, when I think about it, I think the cost of having one nurse come to my house to take care of one person would be prohibitively expensive because it's one-on-one coverage where an assisted living facility has an economy of scale. Mm -hmm. Nursing home also is combining, you know, daily activity stuff along with skilled care at the same time. It seems like that would be the opposite way. Why is it more expensive for nursing homes and less expensive for the one-on-one? Well, remember, a nursing home is literally 24-hour and generally custodial care. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're checking on the patient on a constant basis. And they have to be staffed with so many registered nurses. They have to have doctors, I mean, real licensed doctors in the facility um, so many certain times of the day and so on and so forth. So we're talking much higher costs. Gotcha. Assisted living, they generally are doing a check on the patient every two hours. So they're not, it's not 20, 24 seven, but rather it's two hour checks during waking hours. They don't have to have as many professional staff involved. And when people get care at home, they're getting a one-on-one person, but they usually have a lot of support from family. So the, the nurse might be coming in just to do the bathing and the dressing in the morning. She might come in for two hours and get mom or dad started for the day. And then maybe one of the kids comes in in the evening and gets mom or dad ready for bed. So the expense isn't necessarily an all-day care. Now, some people, especially men, men will tell you, I'm not leaving this house other than a pine box. Right, right. So, <laughs> I heard that all the time. Yeah, d- I mean, people are going, there's no way I'd say, I heard that all the time. Mm-hmm. So what happens is he will, he will stay at home longer, but eventually the cost of his home care starts equaling the cost of assisted living or more. And that's where the family has to look at their finances because mom is still perfectly healthy 
and potentially has another 10 or 15 year lifespan, we have to make sure her style of living doesn't become financially impacted by spending all this money on dad's care. So they cut their losses and dad goes to assisted living. We didn't even talk about that, about the fact that long-term care, super important, not just to pay for the care, but so the person that's alive, if there's a surviving spouse, they can still they can still live. That person doesn't go through all their money. Right. When you have home care, remember, you are still keeping the home going. There's still a mortgage because, you know, unfortunately, people don't pay off their homes anymore like they used to. Right. For many people, there's still a mortgage. There's property taxes. There's upkeep to the property. The house may need a new roof. You get the idea. It's the same expense you've always had maintaining a home. And on top of that, you're paying for those caregivers to come to the house and take care of you. So at some point, if it starts eating into the assets, remember, assets create income, and that income has to keep the surviving spouse going. So if we start eating into assets that it's going to start diminishing the income, that's where you have to cut your losses. Now we're in trouble. Right. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about coverage, because coverage, as you know, has changed a ton. When I was an advisor in the late 90s, there were a bunch of companies that were in the long-term care space. It seems like actuaries got this really wrong. And so prices went through the roof on long-term care policies. Is that what happened or is that an oversimplification? I would call it a bit of an oversimplification, though it is partially correct. To say they got it wrong is a little cruel. (laughs) (laughs) With what they were working with and what they knew, it made sense. But things changed. For instance, remember when a lot of these policies were being priced, interest rates were 12%. They've done nothing but go down over the past two and a half decades. So the claims are paid, 40 to 60% of them are paid with money that comes from interest-bearing accounts that the insurance company has invested the premium in. So if the interest rates go from 12 to 3, we have a big problem. That's part of what happened. The other thing is at the time, this was a new industry. They didn't know that women would go on claim twice as often as men and be on claim 50% longer. So original policies, everybody paid the same price. And that was killing the pricing because the women were getting a great deal. Yeah. Those were the types of things that happened. They they thought people would just give a say, I don't want this anymore. It's called a lapse rate. And that they would just let the lapse the policy lapse. Once people buy these, they don't let them go. They sure. if if they get that this is important, they really get it. It's the most held on to policy in the business. So that didn't happen. This was a new industry. They didn't know. They were basing it on other data that just didn't happen to apply or interest rates no one could predict would plummet. I didn't think about the interest rate issue. I thought about longevity, women getting a great deal. I thought about that part. But the other part makes a ton of sense Mm -hmm. to me. They're earning a quarter on that money of what they expected to earn on the money as premiums came in. How do we cover this? What should we look for in a long-term care policy? How are people looking at these things now versus when I was practicing in the late 90s? Well, things have changed a lot. There are now, there's long-term care coverage on what we call financial products. And what this does is put a solid baseline under the long-term care where we can give them guarantees in some instance. It depends which financial base product they buy. But what it does is change the whole outlook. So remember in the past, when you bought a regular traditional long-term care policy, if you never used it, the money was gone. And of course, that's what that healthy male is going to say. He's like, it's a waste of money. I'm going to be in the 30% and there's no reason for me to buy one of those things. We don't know he's going to be in the 30%, do we? So what if we could tell him, look, I understand you fear you won't use it. I mean, let's put it, you know, nobody wants to use it. Sure. It's like your car insurance. I don't buy it to go smash into somebody. Right. So if you could show somebody, look, if I can show you a solution that is going to pay whether you need care or not, would that be more comfortable to you? So what you have is a financial product as a baseline. So let's use life insurance with a long-term care writer. Those were the common products um, originally that came out. So you bought a life insurance policy, but there was a rider added to it saying, if you ever need long-term care, you're going to be able to collect your own death benefit while you're alive. Oh. And you're going to get it on a monthly basis. 
whatever's left will be paid to your family. In fact, Mr. Smith, we can show you the rate of return this will get at any given age that you were to decease or need long-term care. So it literally becomes part, it's a non-correlated asset in the portfolio. In other words, it's not tied to, it's a guaranteed, this, if you use a guaranteed product, which they have, you know exactly. You don't know when you're going to die or need long-term care, but you know exactly what you'll get if that event happens at any specific age. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about leverage, about knowing this piece of your portfolio is going to have X number that correlates to, you know, I need Y return on my money to make sure everything's okay. You can put those two together. Correct. Gotcha. Because it's going to remain, it's that immediate leverage, whether you need it five years after you buy it or 20 years after you buy it, it's there. Is that the most popular way people are covering it now is through well, like a life insurance solution? There's a couple of ways that both use life insurance as the foundation. So mm-hmm. what we just talked about is one way, but probably the most popular right now is called a hybrid long-term care policy. And what it is, it has a small life insurance component to it and a larger long-term care component to it. So you're going to get more long-term care coverage, but you still have that death benefit that's going to protect your premium. So instead of, if you were to pass away never needing the policy, instead of getting this large death benefit, your family would get back the premium you paid, or depending when you bought it, it could be you know maybe 50% more than that. So the return would equate to maybe the same thing as a CD. So at the very least, you're not robbing your legacy to pay for this coverage that you may not use. Correct. But the advantage to it is the amount of long-term care coverage you get far exceeds what you would get if you use life insurance with an LTC rider. So if you're really looking just for long-term care coverage, but you do not want to risk losing your premium, that's a good product for you to look at. Um, And it has features more like traditional policy. You can get inflation. You can choose how many years you want benefits for. Let's break these down for a second because some people might not know what we're talking about. When you say inflation, that means the value of your coverage will go up as there's inflation on the cost of care. Right. Your benefit grows with time. Gotcha. And there's different options you can choose based on how old you are and your comfort level and maybe the premium you can afford to pay. So obviously a 3% simple interest would cost far less than a 5% compound interest option. But younger people should probably be looking at the compound option, I would imagine. At least 3% yeah, compound sure. versus simple. You know, some some companies, Sean, put these really sexy seeming writers on policies. Are there any of them that make you roll your eyes and you go, y- you shouldn't look at that? Well, the, yeah, there are a few. I'm not the biggest fan of chronic illness writers. There are a few that, that are okay as far as being clear what they cover, but some of them are very confusing. For instance, it looks like it's free, but it isn't. They don't charge policy charges on the front, and they charge it on the back end when you use it, and it's a significant reduction of your benefits. Wow. And a lot of times the client doesn't understand that's what they've bought from their advisor. They think they're getting the full amount and and they're not going to get that. Then they also find out that it may only cover them if their condition is permanent. And with the advances in medicine, I I mean, my husband, he was an amateur racquetball player and all of his friends are racquetball players. They're all having hip and knee replacements. (laughs) You know, and a few have had complications and have been in a nursing home for rehab. One of our friends was there for six months because he had a particularly difficult situation getting his, his knee repaired. That's called a temporary claim. That would be covered under a true long-term care policy versus a chronic illness policy may or may not cover it. You have to read that fine print very carefully. So if a consumer stays with a policy that's called long-term care, those are things they don't have to worry about. I was laughing there, Sean, by the way, not because knee replacement's funny, but because my back hurts even right now. (laughs) And I see that in my future. And it was kind of a doomsday laugh there. I'm like, yeah, I'm there. How's your mom's back? Mom's back is fine, except when uh, she's got to carry Doug around. So yeah, that's that's never good. (laughs) Sean Britt from Nationwide. Thanks for hanging out with us and nerding out about long-term care. It was fun. Thank you for having me today, Joe. 
Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And not only is it afternoon tea day, it's also vinyl record day. To celebrate, Joe's mom and I are going to go through her old Perry Como records. Look it up, millennials. That's a real person. And asking ourselves this question. Back in 2015, a guy named Martin Shkreli, more unpopularly known for jacking up drug prices and serving jail time for it, paid $2 million for a piece of vinyl. Here's the question. What was that album? I'll be back with your answer after I go sing Sweet Caroline with Joe's mom upstairs. Big thanks to Grammarly for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Grammarly's a communication tool that helps people like you and I improve our writing so it's mistake-free, it's clear. And because of that, then it's a lot more effective. Grammarly encourages everybody, even the best students and the top pros, to use Grammarly to do their best work to accomplish even more of their goals. Frankly, because I write so many notes and I write them quickly, I rely on Grammarly to uh, to kind of be like that third party observer, right? The person going, whoa, 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 ease up, bud. That doesn't work. Well, I'll say that much of the time I knew in my brain what I should have done. Grammarly does a much better job. Grammarly allows me to work faster and still not inadvertently step in it. So what is it? It's a writing assistant. It makes you look and sound smarter. It helps you easily improve yourself and your communication, whether it's at school, work, or almost anywhere. Grammarly helps you show your best self through writing, and it's available across all platforms, including, this is what I use, online browser extension. I also use a desktop editor. I do not use the mobile keyboard checker, and I know OG and I have talked about that 50 million times, and I got to get on that. But as I mentioned, multiple browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, wherever you are, they are, and lots of platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. The free product reviews critical spelling and grammar, but I like Grammarly Premium because it not only does that, it also does advanced punctuation, looks at structure, style within context, vocabulary suggestions, conciseness, and readability for different occasions. So whether it's a business proposal, an academic essay, you're putting a script together for a podcast, just saying, casual blog post, I'm writing back to somebody about scheduling for the show. It doesn't matter what it is. Grammarly's always there to help. So with Grammarly, you can stop making email typos because you're fat fingered something on the phone, or you close more deals at work this year with your emails, or you polish your resume to get that new job. Grammarly's always there when you need them. So here's what you do. You go to Grammarly.com forward slash SB, and we've got you hooked up. Listen to this. You're going to get 20% off your Grammarly premium account today. That's Grammarly.com forward slash SB for 20% off your Grammarly premium account. How about that? Thanks to Grammarly. Welcome back, music aficionados. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And just a word of warning, Joe's mom can air guitar ZZ Top like nobody's business. But we have more important stuff to get to, like your trivia, which was this. Before the break, I asked you about the most expensive vinyl ever sold to a guy named Martin Shkreli back in 2015 before he went to jail. What was the album? You may have guessed classics such as Elvis or The Beatles or even Frank Sinatra. But, and let me be the first one to break it to you, those answers are all swing and a miss, as they say. Although Elvis is in the top five and The Beatles scored two spots for themselves, the claim to having the most expensive vinyl record ever sold goes to the Wu-Tang Clan. The group's unreleased album, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, was bought by Martin Shkreli for $2 million in 2015. Martin was ordered to forfeit the album, though, when he was convicted of securities fraud in 2018. I'll tell you another place you can spend your money on vinyl. Putting new seats in a 77 El Camino. That'll set you back a few. See ya! Do you remember that record? No. So the Wu-Tang Clan made one, is my understanding. Shikrali bought it with all the money he ripped off of people on EpiPens and other stuff. And before he went to jail, he uh, he paid $2 million to have the only one. That's why it was 
so expensive. Hmm. Big thanks to Sean Britt for stopping by. You know, this is an important area, OG, and I like I like this distinction that Sean makes between self-insuring because guys like me, as I mentioned, I would always say, hey, you can self-insure. And she's like, well, by definition, there is no such thing. It's self-funding. And so, to, well, and to tell people just how expensive that is, it is expensive. There's no cheap way around this issue. Well, and that's it. I mean, all you're trying to determine when you're, quote, self-insuring is who do I want to transfer the risk to, if anyone? For our clients, a lot of times it ends up being a mixture, right? They're going to take some of the risk and they're going to transfer some of the bigger risk to an insurance company. And this is true with every type of insurance, by the way. Yeah. No, it's it just long-term care, I think, is the one that the downsides are so big that it's oh, yeah. it's magnified by a bajillion times. But you're right. It's the same thing with your car insurance. Yeah. I mean, when you have a decent cash reserve, you can have a higher deductible on your home insurance policy. Yeah, right. You know, that sort of stuff. So, kind of, you know, you can apply the same principles. The problem is, is that, you know, with long-term care, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, potentially, right at the time where you know, your portfolio is starting to decline as it relates to, you know, cash flows and that sort of thing. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Well, for me, it's uh, putting mom in the nursing home and um, not visiting her, but <laughs> don't do that. It's the New Year's. You saw me just take a big gulp because I thought I had a second. I almost spit it all over the microphone. Do you ever feel that way with your mom? Like, I will put you in a home. If you keep acting this way, I'm kidding. I would never do that. Actually, I would, to be honest. With you. <laughs> but she has really great long-term care insurance. So there you it'll go. It'll be nice. It'll be a nice place. <laughs> nice place away from you. That is absolutely so, horrible. Just private island. Hey, mom, you know how we're paying for all this? This is a huge benefit. Have I shown you the beautiful facilities up in Montana? There are 67,000 things wrong. With everything you just said. That's absolutely horrible. I'm just kidding. If you yes. don't know, I'm kidding. Chill out. He is, yes. Chill out. Send your letters to chill out at. Yeah. It's actually your loved ones and your time. That's Pretty why. Close. That's why. They, they, <laughs> that's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. It's a simple application, affordable prices, and of course, all policies issued by Mass Mutual. Uh, over 160 year old insurer. And today, oh man, I just opened up the lifeline to see who we're throwing it out to. And here, getting close to football season, we're throwing out the lifeline to go blue. Hi, Joel. I'm trying to follow OJ's advice and invest everything I have into a glide path. Currently, 100% of my money is in the Vanguard total bond fund, which has an expense ratio of 0.15%. The Schwab total bond fund has an expense ratio of 0.14%. So I know I should move everything from Vanguard to Schwab. <laughs> However, doing so will probably incur a taxation of about $32. <laughs> so what are your thoughts? Thank you. I'm glad people have <laughs> Okay, Rich, Richie told me what this is about, but I hadn't listened to that before now. That's pretty good. <laughs> Somebody... Joel and OJ. I like it. <laughs> Invest in the glide path. Like like how He dropped he dropped one of everything. He got the <laughs> he glide did. path, he got all bonds, the expense <laughs> ratio, the tax bill. It's, uh, it's impressive. Oh. I, I want to know how long did it take to string all that together? Oh. You know what I mean? Like how long did it take this young man to uh, to to put that together. That's called <laughs> earning your T-shirt right there. That's right. Yeah, that is earning your shirt. That is fantastic. Everything we've railed about in the last six months, all in one place. Um, just well done. yes, well done. good job. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's any. I think our work is done here. That's right. Our Let's work. Go. Our work is done. Thanks for the question, Spartian. By the way, go blue, Sparty on. If you've got a question for the lifeline, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. By the way, we've been working through these so quickly. We have front row seats, man. We have front row seats, and I'm very excited 
about that, that we can get to questions that don't say, Hey, now that we're in the new year, <laughs> that's, that is, that is good stuff. <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for today. Thanks to everybody who not only has left us a lifeline, but people have left us a review. I can't stop laughing. Mom loves putting those on the refrigerator and uh, just warms her heart when people leave a review so people know what they're getting into with the Stacking Benjamin Show. And uh, second is if you're looking for good financial planning help in your corner, OG and his, as we turn the corner into fall here soon. Oh, yuck. Gosh, can you imagine? It's getting close, man. And I know that when September hits, it's people go, done. hey, uh, look at these credit card bills. <laughs> wow, we had some fun this summer. If you need better financial planning help in your corner and you're looking for that, uh, OG and his team are taking clients for their calendar. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned on today's episode? Well, here's what they should have learned. First, take some advice from Sean Britt and create your long-term care plan early. You'll have more flexibility and options if you plan well ahead of time and have a better chance of protecting your nest egg. Second, buy now, pay later? How about sticking with buy when you have the money? While absence makes the heart grow fonder, in many cases with retail therapy, if you wait a couple days, the urge to splurge often goes away. But the big lesson? Don't let Joe's mom binge on Adele Records. She's got the whole bridge club dancing upstairs, and that's even before they cracked open the second bottle of wine. Those ladies can jam. Special thanks to Sean Britt from Nationwide Insurance for stopping by the basement. You can find more info about long-term care on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Saw another movie again yesterday, OG. Shocking. Yeah, yeah, weird. This one was called The Farewell. What's wrong, Dad? Please tell me. Your nan is dying. She doesn't know, so you can't say anything. The family thinks it's better not to tell her. Why is that better? Chinese people have saying, when people get cancer, they die. To China. Wedding is an excuse so everyone can see her. He's my only cousin. Do you think I should be there? You can't hide your emotions. If you go, then I will find out right away. Really? Yeah. Zala? So Grandma's asking her ability what's wrong when she sees her because it's true. This young American woman of uh, Chinese descent goes back with her family, uh, ostensibly for a wedding OG, but that's because her cousin decided to throw himself under the bus and get married as a way for everybody to head to China. Because as you heard that in Chinese culture, when an old person dies, they don't tell them because they don't tell who they don't tell the person who's dying that they're dying.
they lie to them and they tell them that they got their test results back and they're doing great. It's just it's just a, a cough or a whatever or something. And they wait. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's funny because at the beginning of this movie, it said it's based on an actual lie. When when I when I uh, first heard about this movie, I thought that sounds like a really heavy topic. And then we went to go see it and I saw that it said it's a comedy. And this movie is very funny. It's it's incredibly funny. And this poor woman bridging the cultural gap between the United States, where I think it's illegal to tell somebody for, you know, the medical professional to be in on it and not tell them what the real diagnosis is. Fairly certain it's illegal. The um, bridging that versus a different culture where they think if you tell them, it makes it more likely they'll die. Uh, So they don't tell them because the person thinks they're healthy, they'll be healthy. And so she ends up with her family going ostensibly to this wedding and um, trying to say goodbye to her grandma without her grandmother knowing that she's saying goodbye. This was a phenomenal movie. This is a great movie. It was so, uh, uh, I laughed. Uh, It's very sad. It has a very cool ending that I did not expect at all. Big, big time thumbs up for The Farewell. Here's how good this movie is. You know, Cheryl and I go to discount movie on Tuesday afternoons. She has the, she, uh, she, she gets in free cause she's taking a senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> take your, that was pretty good. It's take your senior citizen, the movie day. Yes. Yep. But we went to this theater and normally when we go see a movie on Tuesday afternoon, there's either us or maybe at the most six other people in the theater. This theater was half full on a Tuesday afternoon and people were laughing out loud during the movie. Like when I go to a packed, you know, a packed screening on opening weekend, you'll hear people sometimes clap or get into the movie. But rarely this movie was half full on a Tuesday and I felt like the whole audience was in it. Uh, That's how good this film was. Uh, Very fun. Some subtitles, which generally, you know, make people go, nope, hard pass. Do not want to read my movie. I go to a movie to watch my movie because uh, it's back and forth between English and Chinese and a little Japanese. But man, man, was it fun. The Farewell. This is where you say, all right, I'll put it on the list, which is your total lie based on an actual lie that OG is about to tell. Come on. I'm not going to I'm not gonna put this on the list. <laughs> I didn't hear a single explosion. Does grandma explode? <laughs>